All right, thanks guys, thanks for joining. My name is Jeff Collins, I'm from Ericsson. Um, I'm joined today with uh, Simon Harmon from Netronome. And we're gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, layer three tunneling support in OVS, what we've been doing, what we're working on, and, and where we're at. Uh, we're gonna start out by, by taking a look at where OVS is and, and where it's going, what kind of requirements and use cases we're taking a look at. Uh, we're going to then go into implementation details, walk us through how we're doing it. Simon's going to take us through that. Uh, we'll then do a, a brief demo, take a look at some performance figures, um, and uh, what kind of changes we're going to see coming up, um, coming up soon. So to start out, OVS, primarily, uh, uh, usually, typically, a layer two type device, right? Usually we just need to be able to get some kind of, of layer two service provided uh, into the, the VMs, which works great, solves most of the, the use cases that are typically out there today. Um, and then if you needed to do any kind of additional layer three functionality, that was typically done on the Linux OS itself, like IP porting, IP tables, things like that, right? Um, when it came to the layer two forwarding, there were typically two different types of, of implementations that we took a look at. One of them was uh, where we provided just straight VLANs up to, uh, to the VMs through the Linux kernel, or we then uh, started out with, um, with VXLAN tunnels, right? Uh, but now, now we need to start doing a little bit more, more, uh, more capabilities, more layer three type functionality within OVS itself. Um, when you take a look at how OVS is being used today, pretty much been the kind of the de facto standard when it comes to uh, doing your virtual bridging. It's been used by a lot of different uh, SDN controllers back uh, that are out there today. Um, looking at uh, Open Daylight with, with NetVert, that's uh, one that Ericsson supports and does a lot of development in. Um, OVN, uh, Nuage, a lot of other SDN controllers use OBS. So it's a pretty critical uh, piece of functionality to be able to, to connect your VMs up into your networking aspects, okay? Now, What's important here is OVS is really becoming the, uh, the place where we're gonna implement all these new technologies here. Layer three forwarding is being done in OVS now, NAT, firewalls, VPNs as a service, things like that. Uh, it really gives us a nice opportunity now to uh, define on how, to look at how we're going to accelerate OVS, how we bring in these different tunneling technologies, right? And we can do that by doing things like DPDK, um, hardware offloading, really to address some of the, the use cases that are coming up. Now, the first one that we focused on, L3 VPN, doing MPLS over GRE. That was our primary use case that we've been working on. That one's fully developed now and fully and complete. Um, MPLS over UDP, that's one that, that's pretty well near the end of completion now and should be provided back up uh, soon. The other use cases that, that we're really working towards, uh, how we do VPN as a service, being able to, to take IPsec and be able to provide that into the VM itself. Lisp is another one that's being driven. IP over GRE itself. Uh, one of the more popular ones out there right now is, is SFC, Service Function Chaining Project with, with NHS. Right? That one's getting a lot of popularity in how we implement that into uh, OVS itself. Right? Now, uh, VXLAN over GPE, this is a really interesting one. It's a new one that's, that, uh, that's picking up traction um, because not only do we need the, the flexibility to be able to, to use kind of whatever tunnel we want, but we need the flexibility and uh, really the, the, the diversity to be able to do whatever we want inside of the tunnel as well, okay? Some of the, the protocols that we can do that with, GRE, VXLAN over GPE that we just mentioned, uh, the Geneva, um, when it comes to the tunnel, we need to be able to be very flexible with the tunnel, very versatile with the tunnels, uh, as well as what's going on within the tunnel itself as well. Okay. How we provide that integration between uh, the tunnel and the OVS pipeline, both internal and, and external tunnels to OVS. Okay. And then how we, how we offload that and how we support uh, both layer two and layer three functionality, um, both in software as well as in the hardware itself. Okay. So now it comes to the, the implementation and Simon's gonna walk us through some of the details on how we're doing that. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk a little bit today about some work that's been going on in this area. Um, so this is mainly focused uh, on the MPLS over GRE, but uh, it also solves some of the important problems uh, that would be needed to, to, uh, to make other parts of, uh, work. So the scope of the work so far is, is fairly limited, uh, I suppose. It, we're looking at uh, 
Well, both data paths that are supported, the Linux data path and the uh, user space data path, so that's both with and without dbdk. But on the encapsulation side, we're just looking at uh, the GRE over, um, sorry, uh, uh, doing GRE, and this enables us to do MPLS over GRE. Um, so an important thing that, that uh, I'd like to point out before I go into the bit more detail is, uh, from my point of view, the OVS is, is really, it's a, it's a mechanism. So it allows you to do lots of, of different things, but it doesn't really enforce the policy because this is, this is uh, bubbled up to the higher level. So your open flow rules and so on would express the policy. And you can implement policy using the mechanism that might be out of spec if you want to. So I, I'm going to start uh, this section by uh, giving a little bit of background about some key concepts that basically the parts of the code we had to touch in order to, to implement uh, layer three tunneling. And the first of these is the tunnel viewport. So the thing about tunnel viewports is it's maybe a little bit different to the non-tunnel variety is that the encapsulation and decapsulation is done in the tunnel viewports. And this is out of scope of open flow or, or the rules themselves. It's like a, a black box, if you, if you like. And, and there are a few different varieties of these tunnel viewports. And there's the version that goes into the kernel data path. And these are backed um, by, uh, by, by normal net devs. And here, they basically are on receives, uh, the net dev will decapsulate the, uh, the packet and then seed some metadata which describes uh, where it came from, so the outer, describing the, the former outer headers. And on transmit, it's the opposite. The, some metadata is supplied, describing what the outer, the encapsulation header should look like, and then the net dev uh, performs the encapsulation based on that information. <coughs> In user space, uh, with the user space data path, uh, things look a little bit differently. Um, so here we arrange things such that the ingress and the outgress, the ingress and e egress of, uh, <coughs> of the encapsulated frames actually occur on a different bridge to the, the decapsulated frames. Uh, now the tunnel, the kernel data pass can also support this configuration, but for the user space mode, it's, it's mandatory. And so then on this separate bridge, we have uh, separate rules which uh, which match the ingress and egress packets and uh, perform push and pop actions accordingly. And so this is the part that's quite different to the kernel. There's no push and pop uh, tunnel actions in the kernel. Uh, but like the kernel, it's, it's based on metadata. So um, after decapsulation, when the, um, the decapsulation, decapsulated packet is accompanied with metadata which describes uh, what the tunnel header used to look like and on transmit, the opposite occurs. Um, so there's sort of three areas of the code that we had to touch, uh, broadly speaking, to, to implement this. Uh, one is to make a, a dis to distinguish between layer two and layer three v, v ports. Uh, the other one is another one is uh, two actions: a push and pop Ethernet, and lastly some attributes to be able to recognize uh, a flow, whether or not it's uh, L2 or L3. Uh, so I'll do the vports first. Uh, so th there was a few different iterations of this on the implementation side, but the, the one that seems to be the winning approach is to simply have a mode for the vport. And so in this model, the default mode is layer two, which is the behavior of all vports up to now. And then we add a new mode, which is layer three. Um, Uh, then we have these actions, the push and pop ethernet. So conceptually, this is quite simple. We, we push our ethernet basically takes a packet and adds an ethernet frame, and pop ethernet does the opposite. Um, due to some, it's not very clear how VLAN should be handled in such a, a case. So for now, this has been deemed to be out of scope, although earlier versions of the code tried to handle it. Uh, MPLS is, is neatly left alone for now, which is nice because MPLS is often a headache. Um, and these push and pop Ethernet actions are not exposed up to OpenFlow. They're just internal actions which are managed by the OVS user space at this time. So you can see them when you dump the flows, but you, you can't add them as, or remove them as such using rules. 
uh, and lastly, the, the attributes. Uh, so we'd like to be able to distinguish between a packet which uh, is layer two and layer three. So this is basically done uh, through the absence of the ethernet attribute. Uh, so the ethernet attribute here refers to the source and destination MAC addresses and the ether type is the, well, the ethernet type. So that's present regardless. And you might be thinking, uh, well, how can you have an ethernet type if it's L3? And uh, well, this is because it, in encapsulation formats that allow this uh, carrying of L3 packets, they usually also allow describing what uh, the packet is, otherwise you can't interpret it, you don't, you don't know what it is. Um, so in the case of GRE, which is the, the, the focus of this work, uh, that will be the protocol type in the GRE header. Uh, so I just included a picture of the GRE header here. Um, so, so this allows us to, to pretend, if you like, that the packet is layer two, even though it's not. Um, so OBS is uh, aware of, of which vports in the system are in running in mode two, or la layer two mode, or layer three mode. It's also always aware of, of uh, obviously, which uh, port a packet arrived on. And so therefore, it's aware of whether or not a packet is L2 or L3, both on the import side. And it also knows on the output side uh, whether or not the vport is L2 or L3. So because of this uh, simple amount of knowledge, it's able to determine when it needs to do a push ethernet or a pop ethernet. So if it has an L2 packet and it's putting it out to an L3 vport, obviously at that time, it needs to pop the ethernet off and, uh, and conversely. Uh, so I didn't draw all the possible combinations here, but these are maybe the two more interesting ones. Uh, so we go from layer three and we pop, put, sorry, go from layer three and we push an ethernet on and then we can output it to a layer two vport and uh, the converse. Uh, so the vports is a little bit confusing topic for me at least. Um, there's sort of three different things inside v, uh, OVS, which are called vports. And so we have the, the non-data path portion of user space. It has a notion of vports. And the kernel data path and the user space data path both have their own implementation of vports. And none of these three things are the same, um, at, at least from an implementation point of view. Um, so. With the modifications of, of being done for layer three, the, the vports uh, in user space, they have this new layer three flag. Uh, and this means that uh, data path vports of the same type, for example, GRE, may uh, actually be running in two different modes at the same time. So it's because this, this uh, flag only exists in the, uh, the user space, the non-data path code, not the data path code itself. Um, so this, so to handle this on the kernel data path, uh, some switching around occurred a couple of kernel versions ago. Uh, so IPGRE is, uh, is is usually used for uh, L3 GRE, and GRE tap is usually used for GRE, uh, L2 GRE, and it's kind of switched around, and uh, now IPGRE can can handle both, although OVS will be the first user of this, and there are none others in the pipeline. Um, so this basically uh, facilitates allowing the same data path vport uh, to, to pass packets uh, both with and without MAC addresses, uh, MAC headers in the encapsulated packet. Um, so the reason that this approach was taken rather than another one which I implemented, which was to have separate vports was uh, there's a concern that there could be an explosion in a number of different types of vports. So if we consider the GRE case where there's L2 and L3, suddenly we've just doubled it. But what if there was another uh, uh, <coughs> a new feature that came along and suddenly we had to double it again, so suddenly we'd be out to four. And uh, with this approach, it's nice to contain just to, to one. Um, so on the user space uh, vports, um, the, the way it was handled there is, uh, so th these are more flow based. Um, and so I added a new flow attribute, uh, the next base layer. Um, and this essentially, when the flow, when a packet ended up with its, its <coughs> sorry, when a packet's decapsulated in the, in the 
in the bridge which handles the decapsulation, it, the, the resulting flow would have this uh, new attribute present and then when that arrives in the, the next bridge in the chain, it will be able to read that and determine what to do with it. Um, so I have to say that this is probably the weakest part of the design, but it, it does work. Um, so, so far as configuration goes, things are very, very simple. Uh, so the first four lines, which is the complex part, is the part that you need regardless of if you're doing layer two or layer three. And then with just the part in bold, the very last line, you, you flip the vport uh, from layer two to layer three by saying true. And uh, well, well, that's kind of a nice part of this the design that's come out. Um, so possible future work, uh, Jeff kind of covered most of these already, but uh, the hard part about this is teaching OVS uh, to understand how to deal with layer three packets. Once that's done, we can uh, support many different uh, combinations. Uh, so MPLS over IP is one, MPLS over UDP, uh, NSH, which relates to uh, virtual service chaining, and so on. Um, and LISP uh, is kind of interesting on this list because the original work that was done in this area was actually the motivation was to enable LISP to be supported in the kernel data path where it's not supported. Uh, this is not con included in the current patch sets um, only because it's not the focus, but the infrastructures that's there should afford uh, reaching that goal quite easily, I believe. And I'd just like to close out by giving some credits because I've by no means done all the work in this area. Uh, Laurent Jacob, he did the original work, um, and Thomas Marin also did some work in this area, and uh, Edie Bank has done a lot of work in this area. He both did the, uh, the updates to the kernel data path, uh, sorry, the, the I, IPGRE changes that I mentioned earlier, um, so, so changing the tunneling implementation in the kernel support to allow this to be supported, and he's actually now taken over uh, trying to get the data path changes merged. Uh, now it's demo time. Over to Jeff. Thank you. All right. So um, OBS 2.5, right? That's the, the the version that we're working on right now. Um, in terms of, of products supported, um, Ericsson's Cloud SDN switch, OBS 2.5 base is available today. We're going to take a look at some performance numbers on that coming up. Um, Agilo version 2.2. This is the the hardware accelerator off um, offloading card. Um, that's what we're going to be demoing here, coming up here in a second. Uh, when it comes to the, the SDN controller, that's actually going to be program, programming the flow entries into, uh, into the, uh, the Netronome Smart NIC here. Uh, we're going to be running Beryllium. Sorry. Um, and then when it comes to setup of the DC gateway, there's, there's not really uh, any kind of, of hard requirements there. Works well with pretty much any kind of data center gateway you can think of. Uh, Cisco ASR 9K, Juniper MX routers. Um, not really any kind of preference there. It's up to, to you on how you want to implement that. Uh, the demo is the setup. We've got two different compute blades. Each one is representing their own data center, their own cloud instance. Uh, push down, again, rows are pushed down through, sorry, flows are pushed down through two different SDN controllers. Again, running Beryllium there. Uh, and then we have MPLS GRE that's going to be connecting and, and sending the traffic back and forth between the two, uh, between the two computes. Okay, they're connected over a 40 gig Netronome Agilo smart NIC here. Okay, just a picture. I'm going to switch over to the demo now. Really quick demo, okay? Especially since we're just going to see traffic flowing. All right, so this is going to ramp up here in a second. Um, running on each one of these computes, we have one VM on each one. Each VM on there has four different VNICs that are going to be attached to it. We're running a 128-byte uh, packet size in this example here, and we've got 10,000 flow entries uh, that are running, or sorry, 10,000 flows that are on each one. Okay. Now, what we can see here is that's capping out right around 20 million packets per second. Okay. That's where it's leveling off. Going to stop that and switch back over. All right. So throughput comparison, performance numbers. What are we looking at? 
We've got uh, running across the bottom, that's Ericsson's Cloud SDN switch. Again, that's OVS 2.5. The numbers you're looking at here with a single core, so with a 64 bat bit packet, sorry, byte packet size. Again, doing MPLS over GRE, so it's not just a basic VLAN or VXLAN. It's a little, it has one more uh, match and swap that it has to do here, so it's kind of a more fairly complex flow. And when we look, you know, between 1,000 to, to 10,000 flow entries around there, we're seeing now uh, a little over 2.4 uh, million packets per second. Okay, so that's with one core dedicated for your packet processing running on OVS here. Then across the middle, sitting around uh, 11 and 12 million packets per second, this is running in a, a, um, with an Agilo Vert, Vert IO relay. So here in this example, if you have a, a VM that doesn't have a native driver built into it, right, we can intercept that packet and still be able to take advantage of, of the SmartNIC or hardware offloading. Okay? And then the most impressive, which is the one that we were just taking a look at there in the demo, the very top line there, that's the, it's almost at 20 million packets per second. That's with using the a full hardware offload acceleration there with the Netronome Agilo SmartNIC. Focusing in on that, looking at, the, at just the numbers of the, the 40 gig SmartNIC here and comparing that to where the th theoretical maximum is, we're able to, to hit line rate up until, uh, sorry, up to about 500 uh, a byte packet size, and then up to that is where we, we pretty much kind of uh, stick around the 20 million packets per second. Okay. So in summary, what we talked about, we took a look at, uh, at OVS. We, we pretty well seeing here that it's kind of the de facto standard and everything here is moving towards being integrated into uh, OVS from both layer three and, and layer two functionality, which has been there for quite a while. Um, it's been pretty well accepted across majority of the, uh, the vendor SDN controllers that are out there today. And as we do this implementation, as we work on providing the, the layer three support, making sure we have that, uh, uh, the flexibility there from the, the tunnel support into OVS itself. Um, our latest enhancements are gonna be available within uh, OVS 2.7 is our target and Linux uh, distribution 4.10, hopefully. Um, Patch is already integrated into the, the Netronome SmartNICs uh, as well as uh, the Ericsson Cloud SDN switch that are available today. Um, and then we took a look at the performance numbers there where we saw with, uh, with hardware offloading, we were able to get around 19 to, to 20 million packets per second. Um, and then taking a look at the, the Cloud SDN switch without hardware offloading, where we were seeing around 2.4 million packets per second um, on a DPDK enabled data path. Okay. All right, any questions guys? Oh, hang on, I think we have to, we have a mic here. The question is, is this going to be a new plugin or it's native to OVS? Or neutron right. plugin or some kind of? Uh, so the OVS portion, the aim is to have it integrated into the main code. Any other questions? You guys are going to keep it easy? Okay, there we go. Uh, any plan to support R2 TPv3? Uh, layer 2 VP V3, what is 3? Sorry, one more time. R2 VP, uh, R2 TPv3. L2 TPv3. Not, not at this time. Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> not yet, anyway. Uh, you've mentioned uh, hardware offload in genes. Uh, which, in particular, SRIOV or, uh, I don't know, we're using for 20 million packets per second? Uh, that, one, that one's an SRIOV. Oh, up front. Just to understand the, the changes that were. Oh. Just to understand the changes that were made to enable support of uh, layer 3. 
uh, tunnels. Um, when it comes to Linux kernel changes there, those are not needed. So those Linux version for the 10 uh, kernel is not needed in case you are using OVS, user space, data path, and let's say DPT acceleration. Yes, that's, uh, yes, so that's there is no Linux kernel. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks.